Good afternoon. My name is Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Road. I'm here with my guest today. Hi, I'm Jamie Contois, the State Director of Working Families Win. And what is Working Families Win? Working Families Win is a nonprofit that works to build networks of people who work together collectively to hold their elected officials accountable on issues that impact their economic security and access to affordable health care. And um, it's pretty tough to hold uh, elected officials accountable in, now in these days because we figure once we're voted in, we can do what we want. Uh, well, I think uh, accountability can come in lots of different forms. One of the ways that we really work with uh, the public is to encourage them in the first place to communicate effectively with their elected officials. And so accountability can come in the form of um, letters to the editor. It can come in the form of um, how we vote. It can come in the form of uh, the way that we communicate with who, when, and why. The, um, a lot of people like to put politicians on, on pedestals, and they're, they're too scared to talk to politicians. And so you work together to try to knock down that, that fear? Um, there are three <coughs> major pieces that Working Families Win does is uh, we really work to uh, build connections between people. We do education both with the people who participate with our work and mm -hmm. also education with our elected officials. Uh, and we also look at ways of really positively impacting uh, the public policies that most impact working men and women um, in a very strategic way, in a thoughtful way. And so a lot of that is breaking down the barriers between uh, apathy or uh, a sense of um, not knowing quite what to do or how to influence public policy, which can seem like an unwieldy <laughs> and... Uh, <coughs> kind of obtuse beast uh, to many. It can be quite intimidating to, to a lot of people. Um, what are some of the other things that WIN will do? You, you said you, as a number of um, agencies. So, um, as a, so I am the state director. We also have um, our health care organizer, Mike Gosward, um, who is, um, works with both Working Families WIN and New Hampshire Citizens Alliance on a joint health care project. Uh, that was funded uh, both through the Endowment for Health um, and through our uh, own organizations. And um, Mike Gosward's work particularly is focused on making sure that uh, businesses and seniors and uh, the general public is very clear about uh, what the passage of the Affordable Care Act has meant to them personally. And his work has really focused on making sure that people have access to information to help make sure that they can get affordable health care. The, um, <clears throat> when you talk about affordable health care, mm -hmm. for some people go and they'll say, certain politicians, certain political action groups, and they'll go and say, well, health care is not a right. And to me, I may go and say, well, it may not be a natural right, but as a nation, every nation has certain rights and certain things that they expect all their people to have access to. It's interesting because I heard a phrase the other day that said um, health care is both a right and a responsibility, that it's the responsibility of each of us to care for ourselves as best we can so that we don't place a huge cost onto the health care system. At the same time that a nation that has the financial resources ours, as ours uh, makes moral choices about what we do with our budget and that through our priorities we make decisions about whether or not we will fund um, military operations in other nations, if we will um, pave our roads, if we will make sure that people who have historically, our senior citizens, not had access to affordable health care until the passage of Medicare, um, have access to affordable health care. Each of those are moral decisions that uh, a people in a nation get to make. And nations all over the world have had the opportunity to make those kinds of decisions. And frankly, um, every other industrialized nation in the world has made the choice to take a portion of their collective resources, their federal budget, and allocate it for um, making sure that all of the people in their population have access to affordable health care. When you talk, but isn't it kind of really kind of weird at times when you look at General Motors, Caterpillar, GE, they want national health care because it's great for their business, but some of the people who are so supportive of the free market, 
don't want public health care? Um, I think one of the, the challenges about public education around public policy that impacts uh, what I consider to be the both the working poor and uh, those of us who are maybe just a little <laughs> bit above uh, um, <clears throat> income-wise uh, poverty. Um, I think there is a, a very powerful media machine in the United States that uh, works in um, it works very carefully uh, to make sure that the general knowledge in the population um, is not as um, well-rounded as those of us who have really studied these different healthcare systems around the globe. Um, there's really positive examples that we can see internationally about how these healthcare reform, reformed healthcare systems function. And so I would say that um, it's very challenging when you are a nonprofit <laughs> with um, considerably less than a hundred thousand dollar a year budget uh, to combat very powerful interests. I think last year alone the corporate executive of Anthem had a, a $10 million uh, CEO pay. So when you're dealing with the kinds of resources that are leveraged against uh, the kinds of information that you're sharing, it can be, a, it can be hard to get uh, accurate information out to the public. And you had talked, one of the things that you talked about, and you were one of the few people I've heard <coughs> me talk about, was individual responsibility for taking mm -hmm. care of your own body. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. <coughs> I... Um, I come from a family who has really struggled with self-care. Uh, we were an immigrant family that came to the U.S. with you know, very few. It was my grandfather's generation on one side and my great-grandfather's generation on the other. And um, really struggled to work our way out of poverty and to have access to education. And I was the first woman in our family to be able to go on and get my master's degree. And um, it was through those that I was able to start having access to the critical services that have allowed me to be a productive member of our society. And um, my grandfather and all my aunts and my uncles, um, ha as we've all struggled with um, having access, I would say, to good quality food and to jobs that aren't really uh, taking a lot out of our bodies, we've really struggled with uh, obesity in our family and diabetes and lots of other um, really challenging health conditions. And my, I myself, um, during um, the early 2000s, got over 200 pounds. And one of the things I like to share is the fact that it was only through personal choices and being conscious about what I ate and exercising more that I was able to stop needing to go to the doctor so regularly because I started caring for myself in a way that allowed me to not put so much... Um, I didn't need to go to the doctor so much because I had nothing to go to the doctor for because I had made personal choices that really helped my body uh, take care of itself. And I say personal responsibility because we all make choices. Um, but I have to add to that that in addition to making choices, we need to have access to affordable health care. Uh, recently I was talking to um, Senator White, who is an insurance broker with, um, he sits now on the Senate Finance Committee. And I had spoken to him about um, a local resident here in Keene who was the first person in the country to be able to afford, um, or excuse me, the first person in the country who was able to get onto the pre-existing condition health insurance plan that was created by the Affordable Care Act. And um, a lot of people in our community know Gail O'Brien, uh, and she has a really powerful story of where she was able after being diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, able to get access to affordable health care because of the Affordable Care Act. Well, when I shared that story with Senator White, uh, he had said, well, that was uh, choices. Um, and that's not really an access issue, uh, that she had access. It was about affordability. And um, it's an interesting distinction to make that when you spend <coughs> over a quarter or a third uh, or a half of your income, uh, for either a catastrophic plan or a plan with such a high deductible that you can't access or afford health care. Uh, you're right, it is about an affordability issue. And um, on the free market system, it's not about really controlling costs. It's actually about seeing what you can extract from the American uh, ratepayer. And so it's um, one of the issues that we've really worked to address is how much of someone's income is actually going to being able to access affordable health care. So, it's a really critical conversation we need to have within our community and our state and our nation. And, and though I see the Affordable Care Act as a step in the right direction, 
Um, it's, it obviously continues to need um, kind of tweaking to make sure that we're moving in the right direction to increase affordability and access. Well, it, affordability and access, I, I view it as a, a play on words. If mm -hmm. you don't have the money, you don't have access. Right. <clears throat> but the, the other part, while well, the, the Health Care Act did do a lot of benefits, mm -hmm. but there's another critical one that no one seems to, to talk about, mm -hmm. and I call it the AFLAC moment. <clears throat> because if you have cancer and you have to take six months away yeah. from work and you got to go through treatment, you don't have a job. Yeah. Now you may have access and you may have affordability, yeah. but you got to take care of your family. You don't want to lose your house. Mm -hmm. You don't want to lose your car. Mm -hmm. And so now you have to make that critical decision. Mm -hmm. Do I take care of my family or do I take care of myself? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people worry about their family, mm -hmm. which is something that was could have been treated at a much lower cost, mm -hmm. gets worse, and then it gets a really vicious cycle. Well, it's interesting you said that. I've spoken to um, some area health care providers who have had people with severe burns come into the ER and who have begged the uh, attending physicians to not send them by ambulance to the burn unit down in the Boston area because they did not want the cost to go to their family. And this is somebody who was severely burned from our area. Um, and so when you, when you hear um, people making the choice... Um, to forego critical care uh, because they do not want their family to go into bankruptcy, you can appreciate the fact that the Affordable Care Act uh, is ending medical bankruptcy and is starting to create a space for people to um, know that if their physician says the best thing for them is to be medevac to uh, the Boston Burn Unit, then that's what they're going to get versus um, a relative putting them in a severe burn condition in the back of their car and driving them down, um, or whatever the option is. I'm not quite clear what an option would be. So um, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. <clears throat> that is, because people who know me know that I've been pretty sick. I've had cancer twice. I've had a whole bunch of other mm -hmm. injuries. And then I'll go and say, wow, you look really healthy. It doesn't look like anything. Well, I had health care. I had health insurance, yeah. so I didn't have to worry about it. Yeah. I had a good pension, so I didn't have to. So all those stresses that normal people have to worry about, mm -hmm. do I go into bankruptcy? How do I take care of my family? Yeah. I didn't have those. Yeah. And most of the doctors will tell me is the, most, the best thing that you had was lack of stress, which prevented you from, yeah. which allowed you to get healthier. This is actually one of the number one things <clears throat> I've heard from people when the passage of the Affordable Care Act happened. You know, they had kids with pre-existing conditions they couldn't get health care for. And now all of a sudden it's illegal <clears throat> for um, health insurance companies to deny children with uh, pre-existing insurance. <clears throat> what a relief that is to a parent. Um, additionally, um, for people who are diagnosed with cancer, um, in some cases, their health insurance companies have dropped them or said, oh, you know, you didn't disclose this condition or um, their health insurance costs go so high that they can't afford treatment. Or they were, it, the health care healthcare, uh, benefits were too high of a cost in their lives prior to their diagnosis, so they didn't even have health care going in. Um, and so you hear from folks who finally have access to the pre-existing condition health insurance plan to say, that's what my physician said. <laughs> The fact that I had access to affordable health care meant my stress level dropped and I was able to focus on getting better. And I'd like to just point out, um, this was, um, I'd like to point out that we did a, something called the Stories of Care series. And so um, if you go to our website, workingfamilieswin.org, and go to the New Hampshire page, you will see um, there is a link that says Stories of Care. And it'll put you to, uh, it'll link you to our blog, and on there you'll see this entire series of um, stories and photographs. And each one highlights a specific provision of the Affordable Care Act and the benefit that an individual in our community has received from the Affordable Care Act. Um, an example uh, is Gail O'Brien's story, and yeah. we'll see if I can. That's good. Yeah, good. Um, so the Gail O'Brien story I had already shared, but you'll be able to see specifically um, a little bit more about um, what happened that allowed her to be able to focus on her healing. Um, another story um, is one that's seldom told uh, is actually the small business tax credit. 
And the small business tax credit actually is uh, sadly uh, slightly misnamed. It should be called the small business tax credit and the nonprofit uh, help uh, credit. Um, because uh, the Manana Conservancy, an area nonprofit that's very well known and respected, was able to, through the Affordable Care Act, um, have access to. Yep, down just down. Yeah, okay, there we go. Good, yeah. <laughs> um, they were able to apply for a provision that is um, within the Affordable Care Act and able to get a portion. Um, it, it's essentially a tax credit. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though nonprofits don't pay taxes, they get essentially a, a percentage of um, what they're paying for health care. And prior, the story about the Manana Conservancy, which is so great, is prior to this, they had to you know, lower benefits and increase the um, cost mm -hmm. to their employees, which is a very standard story of many businesses and nonprofits. And through the Small Business Tax Credit, they were able to um, maintain their benefits and not have to cost shift so much onto their employees. So that's, I think, another great story. Uh, an area business uh, that also was able to get the small business tax credit. Uh, this photo is a little less attractive, but uh, you get it is uh, the H and R Block over on uh, Roxbury Street. Uh, they had also been able to get a small tax credit for uh, their health care this year. So that's just great Sweet. stories in our community. Oh, and the last one I'll point out, uh, and this is great because Mr. a lot Bell, of yeah. yeah, there's been a lot of folks within um, a lot of particularly senior citizens have been targeted with misinformation about the Affordable Care Act. And one of the things that Representative Butterworth had wanted to point out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one of the things that uh, Representative Butterworth had wanted to point out um, is that he saved $55 because, because of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, he's now able to get free screenings and testings for the first time with Medicare. And that's a really significant improvement because previous to that, preventative care had not been. Um, and particularly physicals, had not been a part of the, the standard Medicare package. And that was a significant improvement in me Medicare and something that he thought a lot of people need to know about, and he's been helping create community forums so that others can learn about those provisions. And it, you would think that would be a, a no-brainer. Right. You, you have a simple physical or take an exam and say, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, your cholesterol is a little bit high. Let's start on a walking right. program right. instead of having... Right. Three four hundred dollars a month for drugs. Right. Well, and this was the really interesting thing. A lot of people have talked about the cost of health care reform, and um, one of the major cost savings to be had through health care reform is to move from a system where we will amputate because we've waited two weeks too long, and somebody waited till something was <clears throat> so bad that they needed an amputation, a prosthetic, major therapy, versus actually going when they got the foot infection for the very first time and they were able to go and get preventative care and get that infection cleared up and walk out of the doctor's office with both legs. And which one costs more? You can very easily pay $150,000 for amputation in a, a crappy prosthetic leg. Right. So I think one of the major pieces that we've focused on is that preventative care is more responsible and more effective, both to the patient but also to the health care system and the cost. And when you were talking about some of the small businesses, mm -hmm. one of the things, we always talk about small business, small business, but the ones you hear on TV, you're looking at 250. You can have sometimes up to 1,000 people and still be considered a small business. But the Depends runner, on who. Yeah, <laughs> yeah by who. <laughs> and, but like in Keene and around, you may have small businesses that only have three or four people working. And mm -hmm. they can't pay a lot, but they also want to provide benefits because yeah. they're the neighbors. They see people. Right. They understand right. the, the trials the families are going through. Right. And I think one of the pieces that this has taught me as we've gone out and talked to small business owners is that small businesses want to be able to provide uh, health insurance for their employees. <clears throat> they want themselves, the <clears throat> owners want themselves to be able to afford health insurance. Um, and so we're starting to move towards a system where People who want health insurance uh, can afford health insurance. And when you, you look at some of these small businesses, mm -hmm. you know, some of the restaurants or some of the mom and pop stores, yeah. some of these people are working 70 to 90 hours yeah. a week. And then after all their expenses, they may only make forty or $50,000 as a profit. And when health care is, if you've got a family, you can't afford it. You know, it's interesting. There's... Um, 
talk about affordability, there is something that's going to happen uh, within the next 10 years as a result of um, what's happening with the uh, federal budget. And, you know, we've been talking about the Affordable Care Act uh, and the passage of this new health care reform law, but one of the most significant cost shifting that is going to go on to working men and women who have been paying into uh, Medicare and Social Security for that benefit that they've been paying into, for many of us, our whole working lives, um, and for many people, many decades of paying into that system. Um, according to uh, Representative Paul Ryan's budget at the federal level, um, we are looking at the ending of Medicare and Medicaid as we know it. That senior citizens within a 10-year period of time will go to a Medicare voucher program, which will essentially shift the cost uh, on to seniors with a small, you know, a, a voucher that may cover whatever percentage of the f free market cost um, that's out there, and that seniors will no longer have access to Medicare as we know it now because of this budget. We will now see a, a, a shift um, if this budget continues to go through with votes like what uh, Congressman Bass just did from our area, uh, just voted in support of the uh, Ryan budget. The... Um yeah, the, the new report that came out, 2036, um, Medicare is basically bankrupt, won't have any money left over. Paul Ryan is going way to the other extreme. If you get a, something like a $6,000 voucher, well, if you're 75 years old and you have high cholesterol and you're looking maybe possibly after having by, bypass surgery, no one is going to sell you any policy even if you live five years more, that's 30000 bucks. Bypass per, um, surgery is going to cost a heck of a lot more. So you're going to have a voucher that you'll never be able to, to use. But on the other side, personal responsibility, we also have to look at the politicians. They have known in saying, you know what, maybe 10 years ago we added 1% more in or a half a percent in. They've been... They haven't stepped up to the plate and do what's right and being honest with the American people how the Medicare system is going. It's interesting because um, I have, as somebody who works very hard in my own personal life to keep my finances in order, um, and I have to say that uh, I feel like I have done that, um, it is really critical to be honest about what's happening we have a, a very big challenge nationally with how we budget. We have um, very high costs as a result of um, choices that we've made about how we're going to spend our money. I do think, though, that one of the interesting pieces about this particular budget is when you see that there are um, people who will never be concerned a day in their lives about access to food, access to housing, access to affordable health care, uh, will be receiving a major tax reduction. At the same time, we're making choices to eliminate a promise we made with our seniors <coughs> in our nation years and years and years ago. And um, when you see that kind of breaking of promises in order to give, uh, a, to reduce taxes of multimillionaires, um, the question isn't, whether or not you're for taxes or against taxes, the question is, is as a nation, what is a moral choice? And what would a moral nation do? And if you believe that people over 65 years of age um, really need to be left to their, to their own devices, good luck you know, finding free market health insurance that you can afford that will actually allow you to get the critical care you need. Um, if that's the America that we want... Um, then we will continue down the path of the Ryan budget. If we want to have a budget that actually looks at how do we share the responsibility for paying for uh, funding the promise that we made to seniors uh, many, many years ago. I think it was, we passed uh, Medicare it was in the 1960s in the current form. Yeah, well, 60, 65. Yeah, yeah it was in the, <clears throat> the current form. So I think... As a nation, we get to decide if we're going to give multimillionaires um, reductions in their taxes or if we're going to make sure that seniors have access to a long-term 
uh, appropriate access to affordable health care. So those are the kinds of moral decisions that I think we have to have in our communities and in our state and our country. Um, I have to also point out that it's a little bit um, ironic that uh, when a nation only a short year ago was talking about death panels um, and there was a lot of finger pointing and there was a lot of um, frankly misinformation that was put out in the public to scare people. Um, the fear of death panels was that the, the government was going to get to make decisions about when the end of your life was. Um, of course, that was an absolute misnomer. It was uh, no truer um, than the folks who spread the lies. And I think the interesting point there is that the, the public policy choices that we make now will mean that people 65 and older will have to choose between if they can afford their rent or if they can afford to go to the doctor. And if I ever saw or heard of a death panel, that sounds like one to me. Well, people are not looking at, especially on the, the political side, mm -hmm. even if you do away with Medicare or you do the voucher, mm -hmm. we as a nation are not going to put up with grandma and grandpa homeless on the street. And so you're going to have that problem coming if they can't afford the rent because people living on Social Security. Even, for example, the biggest reason why people are moving out of Keene, selling their homes, mm -hmm. is even if their homes are paid off, you have a $200,000 home, that's $6,000 in taxes. Mm -hmm. If you're only making right. about $1,600 a month on Social mm -hmm. Security, once you pay your taxes and all and your utilities, you don't have anything to, to live on. Mm -hmm. And so the people, we're going to have to solve the problem because putting it off and saying, we'll do it. We're still creating a bigger and bigger problem because if grandma and great-grandma don't have a job or, or they don't have a place to live, they don't get proper health care, mm -hmm. they end up in the county nursing home we have to pay for, or they con constantly end up in the emergency rooms which we have to pay for. And then if it's not paid for, like the state wants to cut money out of Cheshire Medical, then you can bankrupt hospitals and then it'll be around the... This place is around the country. There is no medical facilities for hundreds of miles. It's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> I've been at the New Hampshire State House a lot, and I've heard the word freedom a lot. <laughs> and really uh, what's being discussed is this idea of individual responsibility, and each person is responsible for their own health and safety and well-being. And uh, it's, it's <clears throat> fascinating to think about um, the people. I've, at, at different points in my life, I've cared for adults with disabilities. Um, if a society said to somebody who had uh, severe uh, mental illness or severe mental disabilities, go out in the free market and compete with me, and we'll figure and you'll you'll figure out how to take care of yourself. Um, societies that have done that, we get to watch the infomercials on uh, late night television. <laughs> about societies that don't collectively use their resources to improve the situation of the entire uh, population. And I think back to a time when I lived in Central America. I lived uh, in a little village called Atuapa, Nicaragua. And um, in, that, in Nicaragua, when I was there in 2005 till 2006, um, there was, um, it was shocking to me to see roads weren't paved. Uh, if you wanted to get your road uh, paved, um, all the able-bodied <laughs> men in the community would come out after the mud season and fill in three-foot-deep pits uh, together with makeshift axes. That was individual responsibility. And only when they all did that together were they able to make the roads passable, maybe for a week before the next rainstorm. It shocked me to realize that a country that doesn't have the resources to make sure that it has uh, good road repair, the community that doesn't have able-bodied men um, in it, and in some communities, many of the men have had to leave because they're trying to make sure that the folks in their community, it, their wives and their children, are able to eat and have a home. So they leave their communities to try to find a place to work so that they can send the money back. So there's, there is a problem with having able-bodied men in some villages because the men are all elsewhere working, trying to get money back to the community. Um, 
then they wouldn't have a paved road. They, w they wouldn't even have a road that was passable. You'd be lucky to get over it with a borough. Uh, and you had communities that didn't share their resources with health care. You literally would have people lying outside of the hospitals, dying on the sides of the road. And I just remember seeing those images, and I, I listened to the conversations we're having in New Hampshire about people really need to look after themselves, um, or they need to be able to compete, or they, you know, it's individual responsibility. And I think what has made the United States of America one of the greatest nations in the world is because of the balance we have between our personal responsibility to our nation and to our collective responsibility to each other. And that is a definer of our nation. And it particularly is a definer of how uh, we are able as a nation to point to how our uh, adults with or anyone with a disability or mental illness or our widows, our orphans, our you name it, any group that you know um, our society has really made a social compact with. To me, how each individual is is treated in this country, to me, that is a representation of freedom, and it is giving people choices so that they have the freedom to choose. When you have no choices but to die, I don't see that as freedom. Oh, some people take, <clears throat> may take this wrong. You know, a statistic, let's use the word, the, the bell mm -hmm. curve example. Yeah. <clears throat> there are 10, on, say you get the top 10%, just plain accident of birth, just genetic makeup, you're way out in front. There's 10% there's that may have disabilities or whatever that society mm -hmm. should be taking care of. But most of us fall in that 80, some on the left, some on the right. And to go in and say that um, it's all up to your in, in individual responsibility and individual hard work to be a success. Mm -hmm. Well, Prince William and Prince Harry, they started their life way, way far ahead. And to go and say, okay, I want you to be able to compete with um, Prince William, Prince... You can go a certain point, <clears throat> but there's going to be some limitations. A few people will be able to bust through. Mm -hmm. But even if you look at, quote, unquote, Bill Gates and a lot of these other individuals, well, Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard. A lot of parents would love for their kids to be able to have the opportunity to go to Harvard. <clears throat> but the people who say it over and over again, they're hypocrites. <clears throat> we have a, an individual up at the state house who says, you know what? The Constitution doesn't provide Medicare, doesn't provide all this individual. But his son was born in severe disabilities. But he collects the check, him and his wife, for, for his, mm -hmm. and his son never paid a single penny into Social Security. But that same individual wants to say, let's end Social Security. Or you have another individual say, no helmets, okay. no nothing. But the guy goes gets a motorcycle accident, doesn't have it, but it's going to cost two to three million dollars over the lifetime. Mm -hmm. And it says, you know what, it's the state's responsibility. Well, this is why uh, it's so important for us to talk about what is a shared responsibility, both our personal responsibility, um, individual responsibility, um, business responsibility, state responsibility, looking at how we collectively um, address the issue of, what, 47 million people without affordable health care. Um, we're going to see the implementation of the Affordable Care Act over the next couple of um, years. The full implementation won't come uh, go into effect until 2014. Um, and they're doing it slowly so they can do it right. They need states as partners to make sure that it's done well. Um, we have uh, both um, a state house that has uh, implemented or, or introduced over 75 pieces of legislation to either weaken, gut, or underfund or defund um, affordable health care uh, legislation and its implementation. Um, and frankly, I think one of the most disturbing pieces for me about that is when a multimillionaire, which I've had conversations <laughs> with Congressman Bass uh, and with Representative John Hunt, um, when multimillionaires tell me that, um, you know, it's a personal choice issue or it's uh, really people just need to figure out how to uh, afford health care, um, I always find it a little bit ironic 
that somebody, um, as you maybe said, Prince Henry or <laughs> Prince, <laughs> Prince William, that somebody who has uh, maybe not had to think about affordability issues in their own personal life um, as it relates to health care, um, is saying to a really, really critical, somebody who works doing critical service in our community, such as educating our children, that when they're not able to afford health care, that they should have made better choices. And as a society, we need uh, those people to be committed to teaching our kids, be committed to, um, and feel com secure enough that they can uh, go to work every day and be present instead of going, geez, are my benefits going to be cut? Will I be able to afford that, uh, that increase instead of 80-20? Now it's 60-40 or you know, whatever the, the shifts on to uh, working class men and women are. Uh, in this uh, new society. And frankly, I think it's even more interesting. I mean, all this is in a backdrop. In the last, what, 30 years, yeah. we have seen a stagnation or a reduction in the wages of working men Since and women. Since about 1972, yes. So, I mean, well, now, so what are we, now 40 years? <laughs> 40 years. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we're looking at, and then you see the top 1% who's seen an 80% increase. So you're, it's a really interesting, um, we're not talking about the lack mm -hmm of um, money in our, our country. We're talking about a disproportionate uh, amount of it going to one or two people. <laughs> but it also goes to the pot. For, for some reason, there, there's so many of us Americans who think we're going to be up in the top one or two percent. So what we don't want any laws changed. We want all the rules to remain the same. So when we get up to one <laughs> But in the top one or two percent, but it's just like being a mouse just going around and around. The chances of the great majority of us even getting in the top mm -hmm. five percent, which is 250,000 and more, are pretty slim. How are yours? Are, are you getting pretty close that <laughs> No, I'm not getting close. No, I'm, I'm a long way to go. <laughs> I don't know about you, Chris. I'm planning on making 250,000. <laughs> it might be like when I'm like 75. <laughs> but... <clears throat> But it, it, and it's kind of like it's where I was born in Wyoming. I know people from Pennsylvania, but especially if you go out west. Mm. And so say so you're going to get married. So instead of spending twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for a wedding, mm. the community may get together. The community has the wedding for you. And then you have a house built over the weekend. So that's the community's gift to you. Mm -hmm. And in turn, when someone else gets married, you're expected to... Um, contribute the same way. It's an overall benefit to the community because the community understands if everybody can be productive, the community is productive. I saw a letter to the editor not too long ago where somebody said, um, thanks mom and dad for paying taxes. Yeah. And I thought to myself, I am looking forward to the day in the American <laughs> dialogue that we talk about our patriotism based on what we are willing to contribute to our society as a whole. And I remember thinking to myself, I would be happy to pay more income tax or to pay income tax. Mm -hmm. Or I would be happy uh, to be able to contribute to the mental health services of people in my community who need those services. And I thought to myself, isn't that patriotism? Yep. Isn't that patriotism? See, time went really fast. We're down mm -hmm. to about... 30 seconds, yep. and I want to thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. I think it was quite enlightening. I think the people enjoy it. So have a good day, and hope to see you again on the long road. Thanks.